Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And welcome back to uh, Joy J. Moore after your extended vacation or sabbatical or tangent. It's good to uh, have you. How four. about working? <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. so grateful to be back. We've been working. We're glad to have you back. This uh, is the podcast for Reformation Sunday which falls on October 31st, appropriately enough, 2021. If you're wondering where is the podcast for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, that's also on the website. That one is separate. We already recorded that without Joy J. Moore, so you, you don't get as much with that one as you do with this one. The texts are, as always, for Reformation Sunday, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Psalm 46, Romans 3, 19 through 28, and John 8, 31 through 36. Let's get at it. We should start with John. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Well, that, that uh, it, I, I'm glad you jumped right in there, Matt, with that particular uh, portion of this passage with regard to you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Uh, that 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 you know one of the really critical aspects of this passage is that this is not an abstract truth, right? This is not that there's enormous problems with taking this particular passage out of its context, particularly since chapter seven and eight of John do not ever appear in the lectionary, but uh, in the Revised Common Lectionary. But this is always so. If you are a preacher who is not preaching about Reformation, you never ever have to go near chapter seven and eight of John. So the wider context of, of uh, polemic and significant dispute between Jesus and the Jewish authorities here in the context of the Festival of Booths is uh, significant. And so, uh, you know, regardless of where you go with the, with the Reformation text, I think it's the responsibility of the preacher to recognize the context uh, of where you are in this gospel. And, but, the, but all of that is to say that, that one of the important aspects of this passage then is to recognize that Jesus is not talking about some ab abstract truth that that uh, that there's going to be a kind of assent to. This is not truth in the abstract, but truth that is revealed in Jesus. And Jesus will later, of course, say that uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so this is this is not about uh, a, a dialogue around you know what is truth, uh, but a recognition of who is truth. And what is that truth revealing about who God is? And so that might be one way to engage a, a kind of denominational reflection, I think. Uh, that was another aspect I thought about uh, for Reformation this year is, I, th I think we are in a really critical place right now uh, uh, of, of how is it that in this time of pandemic and protest and politics, uh, that uh, are we engaging in some serious denominational reflection about what does it mean to be whatever we are and what is that going to look like going forward uh, in our churches? And so maybe maybe that that distinction of that Jesus is uh, Jesus is the truth and that's it's the who of the truth might be an interesting dialogue between you and um, and how you're thinking about Lutheranism these days. It's a so, connection between, go ahead, Ralph. No, you go first, please. It's that connection between truth and freedom that I find really interesting, especially when it's focused on, on Jesus as the, the who is the truth. The, we're, at least in a lot of Western societies right now, truth is up for debate. People will talk about living into their own truth or having their own truth or being kind of a post-fact society or kind of a post-truth society as if somehow that notion has become quaint. But, but to think about the liberative aspect of truth and what that looks like to, to be free and how truth brings you into that. A lot of people listening to this podcast probably have their own narrative about how that's happened intellectually uh, for them or theologically or in the course of their own schooling because we're a bunch of overeducated people making a podcast for overeducated people 
you know, we've got our own ways of thinking about this and how school has been both difficult, but also has opened horizons in new ways. But to think about that in a relational way and to think about a truth that hits home, that, 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 in, that with whom you enter into relationship, uh, with whom you fall in love and who loves you, to use another big Johannine theme, is a really important way for a, a preacher to go. So this isn't just like cognitive Sunday, but it's deeply relational like you talked about. The best commentary, best current commentary on this passage is not found on our website. It's uh, from Ted Lasso. And the sports psychologist uh, character, Sharon Fieldstone on the Ted Lasso show, who said, the truth will set you free, but it will piss you off first. Which, you know, probably can't use that uh, at most churches uh, in your, uh, as an illustration in your sermon, but. I think it's a derivative quote too. Yeah, it's usually attributed to Gloria Steinem. Oh, that's good. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I actually haven't watched Ted Lasso either, but uh, I've seen it uh, out there. But I think it's a great, uh, you know, sort of, uh, it's a great insight on even the kind of relational truth we have with Jesus, you know, that, um, that Jesus uh, in this text um, calls us to continue in the word, uh, which uh, uh, Caroline, continue. It's a vibe. It's yes. mental. Yep. Menno. And, yep. but then, and be truly his disciples to follow him so that it's, um, and of course, where that leads us. So we've been talking about discipleship all fall on this podcast, uh, that discipleship following Jesus is not an easy thing. Well, I think Rolf, you're making that connection to if you continue in my word, mm -hmm. uh, that's another, that's an important uh, connection to what I was saying earlier about the identification of Jesus as, as the truth. And as you said, Matt, that, that this is truth in relationship. This is not a cognitive truth, but what truths do you, what truths surface because of, uh, because of that relationship, truths about Jesus, truths about yourself, truths about God. That's really what's going on here. And then what you were saying, Rolf, in terms of if you abide, that's, you know, the meno, uh, the G John's favorite word, one of John's favorite words uh, to communicate this, this intimate relationship that uh, it, that Jesus is inviting people, uh, followers into. And so it's not, you know, of course, the Reformation is, you know, uh, you know, word alone, faith alone, grace alone, whatever. Uh, but uh, that, that if you abide in my word, that's also not, uh, uh, that's, it, Jesus is not saying if you abide in uh, scripture, <laughs> Jesus is saying, if you abide in me, he is the word, the word made flesh. So this whole thing is a relational reality that I think really can um, maybe make a, make a difference for how, uh, how we preach the Reformation right now. What is it that, what, what, what truths are surfacing uh, because we associate with a particular denomination or particular people within a denomination that uh, and in this case, you know, in, the, in, in this case, those who celebrate the Reformation that um, that and, and particularly in our time and place of of this pandemic and w where is it that we're coming to some sort of uh, self evaluation or denominational denominational evaluation about what uh, what is this, what is going to be at stake for us theologically and traditionally. One of the difficulties of the Reformation has been um, that it divided the body, if I, if I use that, that um, uh, analogy. And we are in a, a moment right now where everybody seems to have found their own particular community, their own particular small group to be a part of, whether that's uh, political or uh, uh, a national or denominational or racial or gender uh, identity, we, we are spending our, all of our time finding those little places. And in some ways we're losing the capacity to abide, to be in community with the larger community of folks who recognize the God made known in Jesus. 
uh, I appreciated the way you uh, mentioned um, uh, that uh, truth is not an idea. It's a person. And this person, Jesus, is God in flesh. It is what it means to be human, to bear the image of God in flesh. And the recognition that folks outside of my small group bear the image of God. And how do we reform the Reformation um, in order to be that full community of worshipers of God? I, I wonder if that might not be a beneficial way to approach uh, this, um, this particular Reformation Sunday. Move to Jeremiah. Again, always the first reading on um, Reformation Sunday. New Covenant, New Torah, written on your heart. It's a difficult text. Uh, right, it's a very difficult text because um, I will put my law within them and write Torah within them. I will write it in their hearts. They will no longer teach one another to say, know the Lord for they shall all know me. So like that, that part especially um, will never happen uh, as long as uh, as the earth abides and, and humanity abides. You know, it, it will never happen that we don't have to teach people uh, to follow Jesus and to know the Lord. So what is so what is it about? Um, I think that um, one thing is the, the, the again the concept of knowledge um, post enlightenment um, we we tend to think of knowledge as, um, you know, um, ideas and giving intellectual assent to ideas. And the Hebrew concept of knowledge is really, uh, and, and, the, and the commentary on the website does help with this. It's about internalizing. Uh, so when is it like when Psalm 100 says, you know, um, know the Lord, uh, it's talking about internalizing uh, the relationship. And so I think that's as close as I can come to understanding what Jeremiah means when he's talking about you'll no, you'll no longer teach one another because you'll all know it's about internalizing um, the, for lack of a better word, the Sunday school ideas we first learn as ideas, it's about internalizing them into our, into our completely into our lives. I found the commentary on the website uh, helpful, particularly around uh, what are ways that we can reflect on what covenant means? Uh, and, and then particularly in the context of Reformation, that uh, Reformation Sunday, the way in which uh, in the way in which we engage in a kind of covenant with particular a particular denomination, and how we how we internalize that denomination's, uh, tenets and and histories and uh, and and the way in which um, how how do we how do we think about perhaps the that metaphor of or, or reality of covenant in relationship to um, what we believe and how we believe it? May I ask you? To, um, you've talked a lot in this podcast. You've talked more in this podcast about denominations than in the last ten years on uh, Sermon Brainwaves. So. Uh, What's that about? I mean, because frankly, all the research shows that denominations are ceasing to matter and nobody is loyal to their denomination except for maybe a few people who, who work for it. And I don't mean, I mean, people like us who work for the denomination. So what's, what's, what are you thinking about this year? Um, well, yeah, that's the, that's the statistic, right? So denominations are dying and what are we going to do about it? So then I think that uh, I think rather than, you know, kind of have this sort of sky is falling, this is the worst thing ever. Uh, I mean, what are we, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to talk about what our denominations mean when we're still pretty loyal to them or like we're going to stand up on a Sunday morning and talk about reformation? Well, what are we going to say about our denomination when that's the, that's the, the statistic? So are we going to are we going to deny it and you know just br bring out our flags and say yay yay Lutheranism, or um, 
are we going to talk about what does it wh why are we here what does it mean to be lutheran in this time and place what is it doing for you uh what does it mean for how we engage as a church uh, and how we think about ecclesiology going forward so i think it's a i think it's a critical time for all denominations uh to particularly in the upheaval of the pandemic uh, and and are people going to come back to church? Where is it and how is it that denominations are going to engage in a kind of conversation around um, do we maintain these or not? What do they what do they matter or not? How do they contribute to our conversation around what is church? Uh, so it's a it's a opening up of um, it's it's an opening up of that conversation, Rolf. I think that we need to do as leaders in the church. And that, uh, and that we're honest about it, that we're, that this could be a great time uh, rather than, well, this could be a great Sunday to say, here, here, here's our reality. Um, what do, and how does, how does the preacher in an act of leadership set the table for a uh, conversation about um, why are you here? What does it mean to be Lutheran? Uh, and not yeah. just that, the fact that you're, you've been Lutheran all your life. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate um, that. Helps me understand. Uh, for me, it's 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 um, it's about a particular understanding of who God is, and really nothing more. I mean, that is as as you talked about. It's about Jesus, and that Jesus is the Word made flesh, and God has spoken a word of love and grace to the entire world. His name is Jesus. Um, that. Christ has set us free. And now with our freedom, um, free, it's not a freedom from, it's a freedom for. God has set us free to love the neighbor, to serve the neighbor, to uh, not have to worry about our individual salvation. But therefore, since I don't have to worry about that, I'm free uh, to live um, in relationship with God in love and service of the neighbor. I don't know if I'm going to uh, uh, grab Matt in on this one and make this statement. Matt and I might not be waving the Lutheran flag. Um, and there's a, a, a moment at which I was thinking as uh, both of you were speaking that maybe I'm, I haven't paid attention to the Reformation except for at the 500th anniversary that when everybody was talking about it. And I'm lamenting that right now because, uh, as uh, I've heard someone say, Luther didn't. Uh, Luther wasn't setting forth his life to establish or even preserve the non-existent then Lutheran denomination. He was setting forth to recover the authentic understanding of what it meant to be the people of God. That that particular ecclesial practice of, of Catholicism then um, had failed to do. And um, I, I like to remember that uh, as a Wesleyan, it was John Wesley reading Luther's preface to the epistle to uh, the Romans that was the occasion of John Wesley's heart being strangely warmed. And uh, if I quote another Wesleyan, a, a more contemporary Wesleyan, um, he made the statement uh, that, that fits with what you were saying, uh, Ralph, in turning our attention to, to Jesus, is that we can't understand God in one bit. We need the Lutheran expression and the Wesleyan expression and the Catholic expression. And, um, you know, we need all of the different expressions of how we've experienced God in, in the way that um, Scripture talks about the variety of tribes or the variety of people or the variety of communities who have encountered the presence of God um, in the New Testament who have been, uh, found God in Jesus Christ and their lives were transformed, their lives were saved, that communal salvation you were re referencing, uh, Ralph. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm lamenting the fact that I haven't paid attention to the Reformation and now I'm really hoping that more of our listeners who are not Lutheran might listen to this podcast. I didn't know there was a Reformation Sunday until 20 years ago when I moved to Minnesota. <laughs> I 
as a Presbyterian. And my church celebrates it just because we've got so many Lutherans who have, have come to us to, um, to try out being Presbyterian. But um, yeah, I would, you know, I would urge any preacher, and this isn't just with the Jeremiah text, this is with all four texts, or at least with three texts. I'm not sure I can speak too confidently about the Psalm, but the, um, I would say, don't, don't make this too much about the Reformation, but these are all texts that talk about being brought into the life of God in some way. These are all texts about that discovery that you don't need a mediator, you don't need a kind of clerical structure to have that experience. And in some ways, Jesus promises that through relationship in, in, in the John 8 text. Here, we've got a law written on one's heart. There's a kind of populism that Jeremiah is longing for. I mean, populism here in the, the best possible use of that term. And in Romans 3, we'll talk about being brought into the the righteousness of God, which I believe is, is, is an activity more than it is like a status. And so it's, it's, you know, did you need a reformation to discover these truths? Um, I don't know, I wasn't alive in the 16th century, but these are things that now are, are really important, not just for Protestants, but in thinking about like what makes for religious, for genuine religious experience, what makes for uh, a, a a vibrant religious faith. And so I'm more inclined to go that way. Although I'm all about like denominations interrogating themselves. Uh, that, that's, that's been the watchword of the pandemic in, in some of my circles. Um, and that's not just in terms of like how friendly or how open are we? It's how has our theology let us down or, or how have we betrayed our theology in ways that have uh, done damage to our communities? And here's a call back. All of these texts have a sense of renewal or of a God who reaches out and says, um, maybe some of the other stuff hadn't worked for you the way you wanted it to. Uh, I'm going to come a lot closer and a lot more personal now and, and, and break in in some ways. And that's an experience in the 16th century. It's also an experience in the life of Jesus. It's an experience that Paul had in Paul's own ministry and Paul's own religious experience. It's an experience that Jeremiah either had or longed for. Um, Sorry, that's my route. That's kind of, maybe we should start here with big picture. What in the world do you do on Reformation Sunday? Uh, that's my way in at least. Maybe you should go to the Psalm. What do you think? I think you led us right there, Matt. And that, uh, the way I tie in what the Psalm is doing is it is naming uh, this source and it is God. It's, 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 the source of our refuge, the source of our strength, the one who is present. And if I tie it back to the, 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 the words that we were uh, discussing with Jeremiah, it's a recognition that when we know this God, when we recognize that this encounter of peace, this encounter of strength is the presence of God, that's the true salvation. And uh, uh, then we are renewed, reformed, Re, we recover what it is that the revelation of God throughout scripture has always been about, a renewal of this covenant that the creator God has made to be with us. I think too with the Psalm that, uh, well, I, you, you know what I would uh, I'd say with the Psalm, I'd say sing it, uh, which, oh, Martin Luther thought that would be a good idea. Uh, so you're probably gonna sing this Psalm regardless <laughs> on Reformation Sunday. Uh, and you can make those connections, but uh, but the way in which uh, it that sense, particularly in verse two, therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the water its waters roar and fo foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, that um, that 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 sort of cosmological uh, uh, shaking of one's foundation. Uh, and in part, that's what was happening with the Reformation and uh, that there, the sort of foundational claims about how Luther understood how God worked, uh, really challenging that and, and thinking, well, what does this mean? And then the connection with where we are now still uh, in the pandemic, that that's, that that's perhaps how churches feel, how, how denominations feel. Uh, that that the that their mountains are shaking and that the um, that their waters are roaring and foaming, and uh, and and how we feel personally, and that the psalmist then says, "But God is our refuge and our strength." And so I think there's there could be a really uh, an important 
uh, pastoral move uh, on the part of the preacher with regard to this psalm in our current context. With all of the distractions that are causing us to fear, uh, to cause it, to cause us to feel that we um, no longer have the agency um, to save ourselves or to save our communities or to save the world. In the midst of all of those distractions that are around us, um, this psalm calls us to be still, to know God, and tying that to the Jeremiah text again, and that is the place where the covenant is renewed. That is the way that we are truly inhabiting or embodying. I'm, I'm trying to get back into the John text again, abiding uh, in this community of faith. And I, I just love this recognition uh, that you, you're bringing out, uh, Caroline, of the reality of this moment is in many ways the reality that the psalmist is speaking to. Not then, it is a life-giving word for us today. And in the midst of this distraction, do we dare be still to know God, to see God, to experience God, to name God, because God is the refuge, the strength, the, the one who is um, uh, uh, exalt, to be exalted among all the nations. I admit I had to go back and read that to get the verse quoted right. You know, the only thing I'll throw in is that maybe help people experience the drama of the psalm. We read it, we read it in this quiet, passive voice. You know, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, uh, maybe help people understand the drama, you know, uh, th experiencing the house shaking and, you know, th the chaos of feeling like you're literally going to drown and wars uh, shaking, you know, co coming to your door. So many people, I think, hear this, be still and know that I'm, I'm God. This is more like in the midst of this drama where everything's going crazy, like Dumbledore at the end of the first Harry Potter movie yelling, silence, you know, uh, that's what the, the be still is more like, well, yelling, shut up, but in a nice way, because we don't use that word, you know, and then again, notice the word knowledge. Knowledge is in John 8, that, I mean, that, that could be a theme that ties it together easily. But let's turn to Romans 3 and say a word about that. Matt, uh, you mentioned uh, something about the righteousness of God is an activity. Um, that's, uh, that's a very attractive notion. Maybe you could expand. Uh, well, maybe we should start by saying that you could spend two months preaching through this part of, of Romans. Just, I mean, this is one of the densest theological passages in all of the New Testament. So uh, if it looks daunting, pick a couple of things or one thing that you just might want to lift up. And uh, you talked about righteousness, right? So, I mean, Paul describes what Paul describes the gospel as a demonstration, a public demonstration of God's righteousness. Um, that's there in verse 25. God did, God did this to show, to demonstrate, to publicly manifest God's righteousness. Um, righteousness is not a, a moral category in the sense of perfection or unapproachable light or uh, sinlessness. Uh, it might have those implications. That's not the primary meaning. Um, this is where I think we understand the word better than our uh, Protestant, uh, original Protestant, uh, what do we call them, forebears uh, did. Uh, so Ernst Kazemann speaks about righteousness as a power, not a gift. It's a mistake to think of it as a gift that you hand over. It's a power that's always, it's divine activity, divine activity to save, to preserve, to bless. So Paul's describing a kind of public vindication of God accomplished by God's own work, you know, and so there's the notion of divine initiative, there's the notion of security, but there's also the notion now of being caught up in God's activity in and always on behalf of the world. Caught up meaning that you can't have a private personal relationship with Jesus. It doesn't lead you to be concerned for the neighbor. It doesn't lead you to be deeply enmeshed in the life and experience and hopes and pains of, of another believer um, with whom you share this unity in Christ. And so just to, to talk about this 
as more than just a, a transaction, <laughs> more than just a, a battle won. I mean, this is God stepping in and saying, the last act begins now. And I'm the star of the last act, right? I'm the player in the last act. And I will pull all the narrative threads to a conclusion. And that's that's the biblical vision, or at least the New Testament or Pauline vision of where we dwell today. We're still one of those narrative threads. So we're still trying to figure out where in the world we're going and trying to figure out the stuff that we were talking about earlier. But th that's where I would go. But I, th if the three of you certainly have things to say about Romans 3, otherwise you're all fired. Well, I better jump in and keep my job. Uh, I uh, think that, uh, I first of all, I want to say I appreciate the commentary here because of, of just setting this uh, in its larger context uh, historically or, or in terms of uh, um, the situation in ancient Rome, but also comparing that to the situation that we have today. Uh, uh, the many polarities that are, are around us, um, among us, and then uh, to recognize that, that Paul is disrupting the, um, the social uh, divisions and polarities that are of the day and doing that in the presence of the people of God or doing that with the active presence of the people of God who are practicing a righteousness that uh, causes people to turn their head. Um, not saying that that these people are perfect. Uh, in fact, cautioning against, suggesting that because we point to God or because we found God, we got the righteousness right. No, but we are pointing to the righteousness of God. And it is the grace of God that makes us aware of this. And that is the hope of finding a way to, to be re remembered uh, as a community together. Uh, again, your opening, Matt, is so important for us to remember. This is a heavy text, and no matter where you, whatever you pull out of it, where you land uh, to preach, there's so much more around it. And I, I would just make sure that any sermon that is preached would also cause folks to realize, I've not said enough about this text. I just don't have time this Sunday to really get into it. So folks will go and read for themselves.